Hello, everybody. My name is Gerald Pasquale, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what part of the world you're logging into uh, from, uh, rather. And uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, we have uh, another entry in our 101 material series with Professor Rigoberto Advincula of Case Western Reserve University. Uh, today's session will be focused on introducing the uh, characterization and also the uh, uh, fundamentals of the field of steels and metal alloys. So it's going to be steels and metal alloys 101. And uh, for today's session, I see a couple of uh, familiar names. Thank you for logging in on time and uh, early. Uh, if you're new, and I do see some new names here, uh, please uh, see that uh, you realize that your microphones are disabled by default, uh, and that's because uh, we want to provide an uninterrupted streaming experience. Uh, but please send in your questions as soon as you think of them. I'm sure uh, some of these slides will uh, provoke or rather uh, uh, give you some uh, moments where you immediately want to answer or ask a question before you forget it later on in the session. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to send that in to us by the chat module, the chat module or the questions module in your control panel. What we'll do is at the end of the session with Professor Advincula, we will answer those questions sequentially. Um, so without further ado, um, let's go ahead and turn things on over to Professor Advincula. Professor? Well, uh, thank you, Gerald, and, and thank you, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, this is part of our series on uh, uh, 101, Materials 101, and today I'm going to talk about steel and metal alloys. So first of all, I'm with Case Western Reserve University. Uh, I'm part of a center called CLIPS and uh, director of PetroCase. And uh, I would like to thank again Park AFM Systems for the opportunity to give this webinar series uh, hosted by their organization. So um, my group, I'm a professor at Macromolecular Science and Engineering uh, at the Case School of Engineering uh, located in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. One of the things that I would like to highlight, of course, is the things we do in materials related to uh, 3D printing. And uh, here you see a uh, uh, picture of the uh, Think Box uh, Center and the uh, opportunities we have there to test materials, design and prototyping using various 3D printing and even subtractive machine. Uh, also with PetroCase, we deal with uh, materials, coatings and fluids uh, that are relevant to the oil and gas industry, uh, focusing on polymers that can be used for unconventional oil and gas, uh, used for improving productivity, decreasing the cost of production, uh, and uh, looking at various uses for even oil, shale, and gas. Uh, and what we're really doing is trying to translate uh, the best of basic research uh, towards the market needs through applied um, research or applied chemistry, where we want to uh, observe or increase the efficiency and performance cost ratio. So with that, let's start. Uh, let's talk about broadly about materials um, and the different types of materials that are used in uh, industry and everyday things. So let's broadly classify materials as made up of either metals, polymers, or ceramics. I will not discuss today about polymers and ceramics. Uh, you can find other um, uh, to talks as well as recordings of that uh, in previous uh, um, webinars. Um, so focusing on metals. Metals can be divided roughly between ferrous and non-ferrous. Ferrous, of course, refers to steel and cast iron. Uh, non-ferrous metals would refer to aluminum, copper, 
magnesium and other alloys. And so with this classification, we can look closely uh, at these two types of metals and materials. So let's talk about ferrous uh, materials. Ferrous materials, let's divide this further into steels and cast iron. Steels can be further divided into low alloy and high alloy content. And high alloys can be further divided into stainless steel and tool steel. Now, steels in general are alloys of iron and carbon. Uh, they may contain other alloy elements, uh, that is, uh, other metals uh, that tend to increase malleability or strength. Now, there are several grades available. We can classify them as low alloy or high alloy content. Low alloy content, meaning less than 10 weight percent, can contain carbon in the form of low, high, and medium content. High content can have as much as, as uh, two weight percent. On the other hand, we can classify steel as uh, being high alloy, and that includes stainless steel, which can have greater than 11 weight percent chromium uh, or even tool steel. Uh, of course, stainless steel is well known for resisting corrosion. Uh, and usually the high chromium uh, uh, content, uh, and including other types of steel, can mean increased hardness, uh, resistance against corrosion, and different types of wear resistance. Now, furthermore, steels being classified as low or high alloy. Low alloy uh, are usually used for a lot of different structure uh, um, uses, uh, mainly what you'd find in uh, pipes, bridges, etc. They are less expensive than the high alloy type. High alloy types, on the other hand, are used mainly when high corrosion resistance is needed. Now, steels can be further classified in a variety of ways. They can be classified based on their composition. Uh, and as we just mentioned, this can be in the form of amount of carbon, and then amount of alloying, low or high alloy. They can also be classified based on manufacturing methods. That is, they are made from open heart, heart basic oxygen process, or even the use of electric furnace methods. They can also be, so be classified based on their finishing, such as hot rolling or cold rolling, or product forms such as bar, plates, sheets, strips, tubing, or other types of structural shape. Now, the uh, oxidation practice also allows us to classify them as killed, semi-killed, or cap or rimmed steel. Another way of classifying, classifying steel is based on their microstructure, which can be observed by a polarized microscopy or uh, even classified by X-ray um, diffraction methods. This can be in the form of ferritic, ferrolitic, and martensitic type of uh, steels. They can be classified by their strength level, uh, as specified by ASTM standards. Heat treatment by annealing, quenching, tempering, and thermomechanical processing. And then lastly, by uh, quality descriptor, descriptors such as the type of forging or even commercial quality. And of course, a number of steels and alloys are well known by their uh, industrial or commercial names, okay? such as Incoloy, uh, Nicoloy, uh, etc. Now, how are steel uh, and alloys made? Fabrication methods depend upon the properties of the metal, the final shape and size, and of course, cost. Metal fabrication techniques can be classified into forming operation, casting, and other types of classification. Forming operations can be classified as forging, rolling, extrusion, and drawing. Casting can be based on casting with sand, dye, okay, 
and uh, continuous methods. Uh, they can be classified as based on powder metallurgy or welding. So let's look at different uh, methods for making uh, uh, forming operation. They can be made by forming, casting, or joining. Okay, forging is how you make wrenches, crankshafts, force, etc. Drawing is how you make tubes, rods, and wires. Rolling is how you make rails and beams. And then extrusions is how you make rods and tubing. So the best way to look at methods for making um, steel is that they are also based on temperature treatment or, or manipulation. It can be classified as hot working or cold working, where the temperature is either above or below the recrystallization temperature of steel. Either way, uh, they are still based on high temperature treatment. And of course, steel can be uh, molded or stamped or created into various shapes because steel is, after all, a malleable material. Casting can be done either by use of sand for making large parts, engine blocks, investment casting based on low volume uh, and complex shapes. This can be, uh, or is how you produce jewelry, turbine blades, die casting, and continuous casting. And then uh, miscellaneous treatments could be based on powder processing where you use metal powders and apply pressure and heat to form the material followed by densification and still can be uh, joined uh, through welding brazing and soldering unfortunately because of time constraint i will not be able to talk about 3d printing but of course 3d printing is the next big thing when it comes to steel and alloy fabrication, which opens the door for a lot of different complex parts. And perhaps 3D printing can be discussed in another uh, opportunity uh, to give a webinar. Now, steel, uh, looking at the property of metals, are essentially elements made of iron uh, iron oxide is classified as rust and is an oxidized form of iron. And thus, uh, metals and other types of metal alloys are essentially blends of various elements of iron. Iron, nickel, chromium, or incorporation of carbon. And since metals are treated with high temperature, uh, they can be annealed or equilibrated to result in uh, better types of domain and grain sizes. So those last two terms are we, what we usually apply when talking about crystallites and crystallization phenomena in uh, steel. So let's talk about annealing. Annealing is essentially a heat treatment that allows the metal or material to reach its equilibrium uh, phase this can be done by fast uh, or cool, cool uh, cooling um, or slow cooling periods. Usually annealing is uh, a result of um, heat treatment where equilibration is achieved. Hence, it essentially is a strengthening process. So the goal of annealing is essentially to relieve stress, increase ductility and toughness, and produce specific microstructure. The latter part has a large uh, role in uh, defining the type of steel and properties that can be achieved. Uh, stress relief can be used to reduce the stress caused by plastic deformation, uh, phase transformation. Process annealing can be used to eliminate any metastable uh, phases or negate effects of cold working. Uh, thus, by recrystallization, you're uh, able to achieve the equilibrium um, microstructure. Sparadizing, full annealing, uh, normalizing, these are 
usually terms that are um, used with steel manufacturing to produce different grades of steel and properties, including hardness and malleability. What actually is shown on the right side of the panel, as observed by microscopy, uh, shows different types of uh, um, annealing that results in uh, different domain and domain sizes of iron and carbon uh, alloys, uh, which can be used to classify uh, their type based on terms like white iron, malleable iron, gray iron, and ductile iron. Although these terms are relevant for um, classification and commercial uh, uh, phases, what this really represents are different types of domain grade sizes and morphologies or blend morphologies that differentiates composition of various alloys. Uh, thermal processing of steels, as shown here, is the treatment of a steel with various compositions of carbon. Uh, the temperature, as you can see here, uh, can go all the way to 1,000 degrees Celsius. And the heat treatment can be done as a function of time. Now, heating uh, between 15 to 40 degrees C above the A3 line, as shown here, is a term that is used to uh, normalize or produce a final mi microstructure core called coarse pair line. Normalizing is a term that is uh, used to describe heat treatment between 55 and 85 degrees above the upper critical temperature until the specimen is fully transformed into what we call the austenite form and then followed by uh, cooling in air or quenching. This final microstructure is called fine pair light. Quenching is a term that is used to uh, refer uh, temperature treatment within the austenite phase, phase region, which allows the specimen to form a fully an austenite form, followed by quenching to room temperature uh, in air, oil, or water instead of air. This type of microstructure is termed martensite. And then lastly, tempering is a term where heat uh, or quenching is done on a martensitic specimen to a temperature between 450 to 650 degrees C uh, with the time or as long as necessary to achieve the desired hardness. This is called tempered martin site. So these uh, four, at least four different classifications are widely used as terms to refer to a specific heat treatment of steel, which actually tells you that steel as form is not the maximum or optimized type of property or hardness. So annealing is an essential part of forming the right steel grain. Now, the American Iron and Steel Institute, or IC, defines carbon steel as follows. Steel is considered to be carbon steel when no minimum content is specified or required for chromium, cobalt, molybdenum, nickel, titanium, etc., to obtain the desired alloy effect. In other words, uh, carbon steel essentially refers to um, all types of alloys where different contents of uh, elements or blends results in specific properties. Uh, however, specific amounts referring to manganese, silicon, and copper, and of course carbon, less than 2% uh, is required to classify what we call carbon steel. So essentially steel is an iron alloyed with carbon and other additional elements to give the required properties of the finished product or finished uh, steel product. Now, let us look at this table that specifies uh, some properties of metals and alloys, which are classified by composition, the form and condition, and other types of mechanical and 
physical properties that define different products of steel. And so with this type of classification, one is able to uh, look at the ANSI methods or um, classification based on properties and, that are observed with different grades. So talking about ferrous alloys, ferrous alloys can be classified based on their commercial name or by structure. Based on their uh, application or commercial name, steel can be classified as carbon steel, low, medium, and high, and alloys based on alloying content. Low to high alloy content means less than 8% or high alloy content meaning higher than 8%. And this high alloying can be based on their ability to resist corrosion, heat, as well as wear resistance. Now the classification by structure can then refer to alloys uh, without eutectic uh, composition at 2% carbon and other uh, element composition. They been, can be classified as ferritic, paralytic, martensitic, austenthic, and uh, what we call duplex structure, which is usually very high grade alloy, is used for a variety of high resistance against corrosion. And you can see that this diagram is very much uh, a summary of what we've discussed so far in terms of classification. Now, this is a, another useful table that shows the percentage by weight of carbon in steel in their particular uses. So low carbon steel, anywhere from, from 0.05 to 0.3%, can be found in applications such as auto, automobile bodies, bridges, structures, gears, shafts, bolts, etc. Medium carbon content could be as high as 0.6% can be found in parts like rods, pins, axles, car axles, hammers, sledges, etc. What we call high carbon content then can be anywhere from 0.6 to 1.5. And as you can see in this large collection of uh, uh, parts and classification, they range in a variety of shapes, sizes, uh, what you would call hardness, corrosion resistance, and other types of parts and tools that are used for fabrication. They can also include things that are used for uh, very sharp cutting, filing uh, tools, etc. So in other words, carbon steels and their uses vary widely in shape, size, and application, and all because the carbon content can be controlled anywhere from 0.05 to 1.5. Now, talk about low carbon steel, which contains up to 0.3%. Uh, this is really the less, least expensive, the largest category of steel, uh, typically used as, as sheets, coils, Okay, uh, uh, different types of steels that can be made malleable or form. Uh, typical uses, of course, are in automotive wire products, steam plates, okay. They are rolled and, uh, and then transported as sheets or rolls. And the addition of manganese uh, and other elements improves the ability uh, to mold or make them malleable. Uh, low carbon steel can be further classified uh, based on the other alloying elements present. And this can be up to 10 weight percent, okay? And uh, this results, uh, for example, in higher strength carbon steel. So suffice it to say most of what you will see a steel is essentially low carbon steel. And the ANSI ASDM, or specifically the UNS number, which is a uh, official designation for steel classification by uh, NACE, okay, 
or the National Association of Corrosion Engineers can be as specified essentially as uh, carbon content uh, um, clue based on the UNS number and the composition weight percent of other elements can be specified as well. Okay, let's talk about medium and high carbon steel. So medium carbon steel can be up to 0.6% carbon and a manganese content can be up to 1.65%. So these are essentially uh, a higher carbon content, which is accompanied by increase in the uh, toughness, hardness of the steel products. And they are usually used in applications uh, uh, such as railway wheels, access tools, uh, engine parts, etc. This enables them to have high strength and even flexibility that can be associated with the part, with the part and of course are, are produced um, in a limited quantity. It's still higher uh, in terms of carbon content, up to 1.5%, including ultra high carbon steel, up to 2.8%, are prepared with more annealing procedures and microstructures that result in very fine equilibrated grains or or domain sizes and thus you have achieved or you can achieve here high strength ultimum processing or properties that are used for machine parts or parts that are used for making forging forming um, instruments or machines and again here uh, is another representation of uh, their UNS classification and the designation based on the amount of nickel, chromium, and molybdenum. So for, in summary, you have steel in the form of low carbon, medium carbon, and high carbon content. And that also follows in terms of their amount uh, that are produced commercially and cost. So let me skip this part, uh, but uh, in order to just uh, look at the type of the main structures of grains we're talking about. So when we talk about the mains and grain structure, we're essentially talking about morphology of steel. This uh, is exhibited here in terms of the grain sizes and boundaries observed. Higher heat treatments allow the formation of uniform grain sizes as well as the amount of uh, um, carbon and other elements uh, I'll allow them to be classified in terms of austenite and martensite type of steels. Okay. High strength alloy, alloy uh, steel, steels are essentially micro alloy steels and are designed to provide better mechanical properties and greater resistance to corrosion and HSLA steels can have low carbon contents uh, up to 0.25% uh, uh, okay, and are produced to have adequate formability and weldability. So HSL can be classified as weathering steel or controlled rolled steels. Fair light reduced steels, micro alloy steels, Acicular ferrite steel, dual phase steels are some of the classifications based on the grain size and addition of elements that produces various properties. Uh, for example, dual phase steels are processed to have a microstructure of ferrite containing small regions of high carbon martensite composition which results in high rate of work hardening, uh, thus providing a very high strength steel of very high formability or processing um, property. Here we have a classification based on low alloying, but you can have a total content, let's say of about 2% and a minimum of 10% chromium. Uh, essentially, nickel, chromium, molybdenum are the most common elements that are associated with alloying. And uh, they are primarily used, especially chromium content, 
uh, to increase resistance against corrosion. So low alloy steels are essentially uh, elements alloyed to uh, steel, primarily used to increase hardenability in order to optimize mechanical properties and toughness after heat treatment. Thus, you see this type of steels made up of nickel, nickel chromium, and molybdenum steels that are common uh, use in different uh, parts such as engine parts or different uh, valves and uh, locks. Now, the oil and gas industry is uh, one of the industries that uses various grades of steels and steel alloys. And a primary function actually is based on resisting corrosion. And corrosion could be marine or it could be oxygen uh, or water that is found in pipes. Um, nuclear power plants, other power plants or other fossil fuel plants, of course, use various grades of steel, but essentially chromium molybdenum based steels are very much used. Again, a primary function is to resist corrosion. Now here is a good uh, pictorial representation of what alloying means. Uh, pure metal or pure ferrous metal, for example, um, can be either based on substitutional alloying, interstitial alloying, or a combination of both. Steel, as I as mentioned, can be classified as carbon steel, up to two weight percent. And then the rest of the steel can be substituted or interstitially alloyed with chromium, manganese, nickel, molybdenum, uh, titanium, and so on. In fact, titanium is a metal of choice when resistance against corrosion is a main objective. So titanium, tantaloy, tantalum, or other low oxygenation metals or even noble metals are essentially a premium in metallurgy when it comes to resisting corrosion. Okay, uh, here is a summary of what each element uh, when used in alloying brings into the table. Manganese, for example, increases strength and hardness. They decrease ductility and weldability uh, as a consequence. Phosphorus increases strength and hardness. Sulfur decreases ductility and notch impact toughness. Silicon is a deoxidizer used in steel making. Copper uh, is an important alloy ingredient. However, uh, they are detrimental to hot working steels. But as a, a, a minimum of 0.2% copper, they are, are essential to resisting corrosion. Uh, nickel is a ferrite strengthener increases the hardenability and impact strength of steels as well as contributing to uh, corrosion resistance. And then molybdenum increases hardenability and enhances creep resistance of low alloy steels. So here is a diagram which shows uh, annealing and the different types of uh, structures or domains that can be achieved. Uh, essentially going between Martens site and Austenite type of classification essentially shows the direction by which heating or cooling uh, results in various types of domain and grain site structure that is classified as Martens site or Austenite. Um, increasing Austenite this uh, authenticization temperature essentially increases hardness. And then here at the, the diagram below, you can see the effect of time on the classification and the treatment that results in ferrite, perlite, and martensite. So you can look at this as a sort of a phase diagram uh, that shows the relationship between time 
and temperature treatment in producing various grain size, grain sizes, domain boundaries, and so on. Okay, so more of the effect of uh, various elements added to steel. So again, carbon in general uh, increases the hardness and strength of steel by heat treatment. Manganese is added to steel to improve hot working properties, increase strength and toughness. Chromium is added to steel to increase resistance to oxidation. And what we call stainless steel essentially has 11% chromium and above. In fact, uh, what we'll see later is a table that gives us a clue of the uh, chromium composition in stainless steel based on percentage percent. So for example, uh, uh, steel alloy based on 316, okay, which means at least 16% chromium composition. Nickel. is added in large amounts above 8% to high chromium uh, stainless steel to include corrosion and heat resistance. Molybdenum is added to chromium nickel austenitic steel to improve resistance to pitting corrosion, especially when used in acidic con conditions that contain chloride and sulfur chemicals. Titanium is a metal of choice or an alloying element in steel uh, for stabilizing carbide, but essentially increasing titanium content, which actually increases the cost of uh, the product itself, is excellent for preventing corrosion uh, in various conditions. Uh, phosphorus is usually added with sulfur to improve machinability in low alloy steels as well. Uh, sulfur uh, is used to improve machinability, but does not cause hot shortness. Other elements such as selenium, niobium, uh, tantalum, etc., are even rare, but again can have finite uh, improvements on the properties of steel, both in workability and resistance against corrosion. Uh, nitrogen, silicon, silicon as mentioned, is used for removing or killing oxygen, uh, killing process in um, melting of steel. And as a result, you have small amounts of silicon that are usually added to uh, contribute in the process as well as hardening of the very thick face in steel. Uh, and thus killing or killed steels have higher silicon content. Cobalt. Tantalum, uh, as, as I said, is used uh, for different types of functions uh, for um, what, what you'd find uh, being used similar to niobium. And copper is normally present in stainless steel as a residual element. Okay. By the way, one rule in terms of uh, uh, using steel is that it's always good to use or fit parts of the same steel grade uh, in order to prevent uh, corrosion uh, based on galvanic methods. Or galvanic corrosion actually is a result of using different grades of steel when it comes to fabrication. Okay, so we talk about stainless steel. Uh, stainless steel again is a composition of uh, uh, carbon steel having at least 11% chromium composition. And stainless steel can be classified based on theoretic martensitic out, austen, austenitic uh, precipitation hardening and duplex grades. Duplex means uh, ferrite plus austenite or austenite plus martensitic. Okay, so here are the series designation based on the compositions and types and uh, classifications. So remember that stainless steel will always have a high chromium con content uh, and very often consider, uh, considerable amounts of nickel is also added together with molybdenum. Stainless steels are classified by a three-digit number 
beginning with two, three, four, five. So these are what we call series designation. And what you have here essentially is a composition based on the amount of chromium and then followed by nickel. So each of these series designation, and as you can see on the left uh, side and the right uh, side, determines the series number and the nickel content as well as chromium content for each of those series designation. So this table can come handily when you're trying to understand the types of stainless steel based on their series number. Now we often hear terms like inconel, incoloy, monel. These are very good steel grades that are used when corrosion resistance is called for, let's say against carbon dioxide or even uh, SAR corrosions based, based on H2S. Uh, they have increasing strength, essentially by the amount of chromium uh, as well as um, molybdenum and, and nickel. So increasing the amount of chromium essentially results in higher corrosion resistance. On the other hand, the phase can contain both martensitic and as astenitic or perlitic can refer to duplex grades that has um, higher resistance uh, corrosion again, against martin versus martensitic uh, stainless steel. On the other hand, very high nickel contained or nickeloid or nickel based type of uh, uh, alloys have very high resistance against uh, sour corrosion. And pitting resistance equivalent number or PREN is also a designation to use against this high corrosion um, environment. Here uh, you have different types of alloys. Uh, also there are specified UNS numbers and the amount of chromium, nickel, molybdenum, and other elements present in each grade. And all of these grades are various grades of alloys that are used against corrosion uh, environments, or they're very good alloys uh, for structures that are exposed to very corrosive environments. Okay, so with what, I, what time uh, remaining to us, we can designate that to non-ferrous metals. Non-ferrous metals means that the base metal is not iron, and that can refer to copper metal, aluminum metal, titanium metals, noble metals, and even refractory metal. So copper alloy has been around for ages, and copper can be alloyed with zinc. It's called brass. Copper, when alloyed with tin, aluminum, silicon, uh, is called, called bronze and uh, another is copper beryllium. Aluminum alloys can be alloyed with copper, magnesium, silicon, manganese, and zinc, okay? And they are very useful for many types of structures, inclu including aircraft parts. In fact, alloy forms a natural resistance against uh, a rusting or oxidation by the formation of an aluminum oxide layer. Uh, manganese, manganese alloys are very good alloys. However, they have a weakness in that they can ignite easily and uh, in fact are used in a, a number of uh, armaments or ballistic uh, type of fabric um, implements. Titanium alloys are well known in applications for the biomedical industry, for space, and of course, different alloys for resisting corrosion, including lightweight properties. The most expensive, we are referring to noble metals. Noble metals like gold, silver, platinum have the ultimate resistance against oxidation and corrosion. However, as you know, they're very expensive. Uh, refractory metals like niobium, molybdenum, tantalum, uh, tungsten, etc have high melting temperatures, and of course are more expensive than the corresponding copper, aluminum, and magnesium alloys, okay? So these high performance alloys 
methods are increasingly used in a variety of highly um, demanding corrosive environments, extreme environments, and thus are useful for applications in aerospace, military, deep sea exploration, oil and gas, high pressure, high temperature environments. Okay, so more about titanium. Titanium is well known for light weighting. Uh, it's lighter than steel, although heavier than aluminum. An ultimate advantage of titanium is uh, resistance against corrosion. And uh, it is stronger than alum aluminum. Therefore, you have a combination of high strength and low weight and can be used uh, in elevated temperature components. Um, a limitation of pure titanium, and that's why it has to be alloyed, is that uh, it has lower strength than the alloyed strength. So increasingly, titanium is used for a number of industries beyond aircraft industry. So in the aircraft industry, you would find titanium being used heavily for very demanding applications and extreme environments. It's also used for things like sports equipments uh, and, of course, medical prosthesis devices. All right. So this is actually our last slide. I uh, just want you to be aware that um, there are several organizations that uh, you can learn more, network more, and understand the uh, steel industry, the uh, different manufacturers, testing, corrosion, um, and different types of uses based on, uh, I would not call lobbying, but a uh, band of different industries that promote their um, steel products. So this would include uh, the AISI, American Iron and Steel Institute, AIST, Association for Iron and Steel Technology, NACE, uh, very much concerned with uh, Corrosion National Association of Corrosion Engineer, um, SAE, Society for Automotive Engineers. And if you want to learn more about nickel, which is very much heavily used in stainless steel and alloying, uh, you can refer to the Nickel Institute. So all in all, the steel and alloy industry is a big industry that affects many things that we encounter every day. And that's uh, Steel and Alloys 101. Hopefully this webinar has equipped you with that knowledge so that you can have uh, more understanding of everyday things. So with that, I'd like to close this webinar and give the table back to Gerald. Thank you very much, Professor. So uh, that was our talk on steels and metal alloys for this 101 series. And now uh, what we'll do is we will be taking questions that you guys may have about the material that was just presented. So um, to give you guys a little bit more time to gather your thoughts and to type in your questions, to the uh, to the queue, I uh, wanted to come out with a couple of more announcements uh, for the for the next couple of weeks regarding uh, webinars. So uh, the next entry in the 101 series is going to take place next month, <clears throat> and uh, currently we are scheduled for uh, visiting the uh, the field of 3D printing. We're going to be looking at additive manufacturing techniques and uh, the latest uh, advances that have been made for improving the uh, performance of such techniques and applications from everything like rapid prototyping, automotive manufacturing, medical grade implants for surgical procedures, uh, and many more. So uh, that will take place uh, right now scheduled for Thursday, September 7th. And again, we typically have um, Professor Advincula here within uh, the first uh, Thursday of every month. So. I'll go ahead and uh, drop a link into the chat for everybody. The registration for that is available right now. So uh, there is the link in the chat module. <clears throat> and as before, uh, just like all of our other previous webinars with Professor Advincula and all of our other featured speakers, 
uh, we do archive these uh, videos onto the Park Systems YouTube channel, and that will be the second link I just dropped into the chat module. So uh, definitely uh, take a look at the back catalog of all of the webinars and presentations that we've uh, uh, recorded and cleaned up for, uh, for your viewing for posterity there. Uh, and of course, like and subscribe there as well. <laughs> So uh, let's see here. Looks like uh, looks like you guys might need a couple more minutes or a couple more moments rather to uh, enter your questions. Uh, if you have any questions at all for the professor, as you can see, he has put up his email address up on the screen. He's reachable again at Case Western Reserve University's Department of Macromolecular Science and Engineering, and his email address is R C A. 4.1 at case.edu. And if you're curious at all about any of the atomic force microscopy uh, nano characterization solutions provided by Park Systems, as well as any of the other emerging nanoscale microscopy um, hardware and technologies that we provide, in addition to AFM, uh, you can reach us at Park afm.com that's park afm like atomic force microscope.com uh, and we'll be more than happy to uh, uh, discuss your current application and maybe suggest uh, a solution from our uh, product lineup to better enable your nanoscale advances all right so uh, we do have some questions coming in. So let me go ahead and uh, read them out loud. So our first question here is, <clears throat> I wonder what current methods uh, there are in order to produce uh, turbine blades. Uh, he, I've just heard of a pigtail method, but it seems to be an old one. Um, would we be able to use uh, some kind of method to make 1D, one-dimensional crystal structures? Yeah, to, uh, turbine blades. Uh, so again, uh, these are things that refer to uh, high strength, perhaps light weighting. And um, I would refer that, of course, uh, <laughs> to an expert who can give more uh, advice on the uh, latest uh, methods of uh, forging and forming. Interestingly, uh, one of the things that uh, GE uh, is interested in uh, exploring is the 3D printing of metals and alloys for the aircraft industry and uses in the um, development of engines. So specific components in a turbine blade, again, if we're referring to a turbine that is used for aircraft or uh, gas turbines or steer, steam turbines, are exposed to extreme conditions based on pressure, temperature, uh, and combustion. So um, I would defer that to an expert in terms of uh, what are the latest methods and uh, alloys or super alloys that are are used. Um, sometimes they have different thermal barrier coatings uh, that are used to improve their uh, um, exposure to extreme condition. Uh, perhaps one of the things that uh, need to be emphasized is their fatigue behavior or uh, high dynamic stresses that are present in their uh, utilization. So again, I, I would defer that question in terms of uh, new methods of alloying uh, uh, to, to an expert or, or to a, a better expert uh, in, in classifying their super alloy. All right, and uh, it looks like we only have a couple more minutes left in the hour that we have scheduled here. Um, so if you have any questions here for the session, please send them in now. Um, with that said, Professor, do you have any uh, final thoughts for us today? Well, I um, have uh, have started this one-on-one -on -one series essentially to get uh, the novice or those of you who are new to the field to get a taste of uh, 
different uh, materials, processing technologies that uh, will allow you to appreciate or have an early appreciation of uh, materials, uh, polymers, ceramics, and different processes. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any uh, further questions by email, uh, uh, you know, with our limited time here, of course, in the webinar. And I do welcome those questions. So please feel free to email me uh, with uh, more of your questions, and I'll be happy to correspond with you by email. All right, well said. And um, if you happen to have any colleagues, everyone, who would be interested or benefit from any of the material that the professor presented today, uh, again, once the, uh, the recording for the video pops up on the Park Systems YouTube channel, it's up there in perpetuity. So feel free to uh, disseminate this information and um, hopefully they, uh, they get a, uh, a nice insight into, uh, again, an introductory look at steels and metal alloys uh, or any other field that we cover in the 101 series. Uh, with that said, uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions in queue. So again, I'd like to uh, thank on behalf of Park Systems and everyone here, thank uh, Professor Advincula for uh, giving us a wonderful and insightful look into steels and metal alloys today. And uh, of course, to you, the audience as well, um, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you at a webinar from Park Systems soon in the future. Uh, take care, everybody, and until next time, uh, we wish the best for you and your work and your research. Take care, everyone.